Isn't it? I have this. You got a chance to really think about the world's problems out here. If only someone would invent a really good... You know those things you stare in the end of corn to keep fire off your fingers? Uh, hello, Houston? Humans cannot live by bread alone. They need to be pampered with a balanced diet. The same is true of plants. They all need to receive a balanced diet. Not just individual plants, but entire species of plants need pampering. In fact, a whole biosphere of them. Seems a little ridiculous, doesn't it? After all, plants have been trapping sunlight energy without our pampering for eons. But remember, we depend on plants for energy that fuels human life. The portion of sunlight trapped by plants eventually fuels our existence. The process of photosynthesis stores energy in sugars and starches, energy that ultimately we need to survive. So it's a cause for concern that we are not pampering, but abusing plants and doing it on a global scale. Just what does comprise a healthy plant diet? And what are we doing to interfere with it? When we humans think of diet, we usually mean nutrients. And we need look no further than plant nutrients to find reasons for concern. Take nitrogen, for example. The air is full of it, and yet it's only available to plants when combined with other elements, such as oxygen. But only a few processes in nature fix nitrogen. Lightning, for example. Modern agriculture removes fixed nitrogen by harvesting and replaces it with fixed nitrogen produced at great energy cost from fossil fuel. Unfortunately, we are not replacing as much nitrogen as we remove from the soil. And in any case, fossil fuels will not last indefinitely. So at the most obvious level, we are interfering with plant diets. But the obvious nutrients are not really the core of a plant diet. Plants consume sunlight as we consume food. True, the sun emits enormous quantities of radiation. Unfortunately, of all that radiation thrown into space, photosynthesis uses only a minute fraction, a tiny band of visible radiation. And of the visible radiation that reaches the Earth, only about 1% is trapped by photosynthesis and converted to plant tissue. The plant energy that interests us the most, the energy from agriculture, is trapped by only 5% of the world's landmass. And only a fraction of this energy is passed up the trophic levels to feed humans. We are on the tip of a precarious pyramid. Today, the way we use energy trapped by plants is inadequate to support a healthy global population. So it's prudent to ask whether we could actually interfere with this sunlight energy that is the foundation of our own existence. The answer is yes. With a nuclear holocaust. In the past, the issue of nuclear war focused on whether the bad guys or the good guys would lose. We now know that the big losers may be the plants. And through plants, all human life, good and bad alike. Sunlight aside, there is another important energy flow which may loosely be considered part of a balanced diet for a plant. Heat. Not too much, nor too little.
Humans and many animals have sophisticated ways of generating heat from stored energy and dumping it when necessary. Plants need heat too, but are less capable of generating it and disposing of it. They have evolved to match their heat requirements to climate, which is ultimately a function of radiant heat received on Earth from the sun. Today, humans are actively interfering with this energy flow. How? With fossil fuels which release large amounts of carbon dioxide gas into the atmosphere. Forest regions play a major role in absorbing carbon dioxide as part of photosynthesis. But the world's forest regions are being rapidly depleted by logging. So more and more carbon dioxide is staying in the atmosphere. As a result, there is an increasing amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This carbon dioxide is largely transparent to short, radiant heat wavelengths from the sun. These wavelengths are absorbed by the Earth and cause in turn the re-radiation of longer infrared wavelengths. Carbon dioxide is not so transparent to these longer wavelengths and reflects them back to the Earth, where gradually they are absorbed as heat. This is known as the greenhouse effect. Plants have taken millions of years to adapt to one kind of climate. In a few decades, the greenhouse effect has begun to upset the delicate balance of energy flow. No problem, you say. Now we can grow bananas above the Arctic Circle. Think of all that extra land that can be farmed. The flaw in this thinking becomes noticeable when we return to consider nutrients in a plant diet. For example, carbon lies at the core of many of life's molecules. The oceans are an enormous reservoir of carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. And the oceans exchange it slowly with the atmosphere, where there's already plenty. So where's the problem? Well, forests play a major role in recycling carbon back into the biosphere. Shrinking forests mean less and less trapped carbon for plant building. Plants also depend to a lesser extent on the carbon reservoir of the soil which is replenished by the dead plant material. In many regions like our north, this reservoir is skimpy or non-existent. If we disrupt the energy flow to plants and change our climate, we cannot depend on the simple shuffling about of plant species to solve the problems we've caused. from the survival of a single astronaut marooned in space to the survival of our biosphere with its four billion people. The study of energy flow helps us understand how life depends on energy. And through energy, how our life depends on the lives of other organisms. Let us hope we will be able to use our knowledge of energy flow to protect the future of plants and animals and through them the future of human life on Earth.